Ready? One, two, one, two, three, and...
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you lift your voice up right where you are and just thank the Lord for setting you free. Thank the Lord for salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. We praise you, Lord Jesus. I know we're coming into Christmas. I'm still going to sing Easter. The thing about Christmas that everybody can get around the idea that a Savior is born, and it's so funny. I listen to people singing carols, and I hear the, all the songs, and I, I'm amazed that they don't realize what they're singing. They're singing about Christ coming and Christmas and what it is. My favorite, that's my favorite, one of my favorite holidays, but I also love Easter. And uh, at Brownsville, we sing everything backwards. And here, I want to do the Easter song because if he had just come and not fulfilled what he come to do, we'd still be lost. But because he came and he lived and he died, we're free. We're free today. Thank you, Jesus. Sing it with us. Hear the bells ringing. They're singing that you can be born again. Hallelujah. Hear the bells ringing. They're singing Christ is risen from the dead. <laughs> the angel upon the tombstone said he is risen just as is 
sing it to him. We'll give you, we'll give you all the
shall see Jesus in the air Coming after you and me Joys ours to share What rejoicing that will be When the saints shall rise Heading for that jubilee Yonder in the sky today. 
did you know that at the very moment I speak, Jesus is alive? I said he's alive. Right now, at the right hand of God the Father, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's praying for us. Somebody says, well, the devil told me I was going under. Oh, no, Jesus said you're going over. How many of you knows, <laughs> how many of you knows Jesus gets his prayers answered? Jesus is praying for you. Friend, if you're down today, if you're discouraged, you're despondent, I want you to be encouraged. Jesus is praying for you. He ever liveth to pray for you. Get behind me, devil. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I got tickled a while ago. We was talking about Lendl getting things flipped around in reverse. It was singing the Easter song here. I said, come Easter, they're going to be singing away in a manger. <laughs> you know? And then Steve told me a funny story. Steve, come on up and tell this. <laughs> Listen to this. This is cute. On the way to um, Revival, I, oftentimes I'll take the girls or I'll take Ryan, you know, and Jerry will come in a separate car. And, and I got this little tape recorder in the Forerunner where I tape messages that come to me as I'm driving around. And, and so we'll take this little tape recorder and we'll use it to record songs. And my, my two kids, Shelby and Kelsey, when Ryan's not with us, sometimes we'll sing. When he is with us, we'll sing. But the girls love to sing songs. And so we'll be singing songs and we'll sing Christmas songs. We'll sing revival songs. Just a couple of nights ago, we were, we were singing, some, uh, singing some like jingle bells and stuff like that and recording them. Then I play them back and they just rejoice, you know, how good they sound on a tape recorder. And then so we, we sang a few songs and Kelsey, who's four, was in the back seat. And she goes, she goes um, I got a song. I got a song. I got a song. And so I stuck the recorder in her face and she goes, Jesus. Jesus, I love you, and Jesus, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? <laughs> so, oh, we cracked up, man. It's like, oh. <laughs> we had a little spiritual, a little secular going on there. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Uh, wow. Before you're seated, turn to somebody and say, Jesus got a bright nose. Well, how many of you feel good today? Wish I could say you look the same. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Be sweet. Don't get mean on me. I'm just cutting up with you. So good to be here today. And this is, um, we're coming up now only four more Sundays left in this year after today. Next Sunday is the 5th, and you've got the 12th, the 19th, 26th. Gee whiz. Where did the last several years go? I mean, the last two years for me went just like that. They're gone. I remember last year, whenever we saw that ball drop up there in New York, you know, for 1999, I thought, man, another year, and it'll be 2000. That seems like that was just several weeks ago. And here it is, 2000, almost 2000. Makes you wonder what's going to happen, doesn't it? I don't know about tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know all is well. God's going to take care of everything. We, um, today we want, I want to um, come before you and I want to talk to you for a few moments. I'm going to bring a message in a moment concerning David, David and Ziglag. We're going to be preaching part four on embracing adversity. But today, I wanted to come before you and I wanted to share just a few minutes with you from my heart. 
Um, this, this past four and a half years has just been absolutely awesome. And I really don't see any let up in what God is doing. As a matter of fact, I can envision the Bible school here in Pensacola in just a matter of another year or so being four or 5,000. I can envision that. Our problem is not going to be students, it's going to be facilities to hold the students. Matter of fact, how many of our seniors that's, going to be, that's, that's here this morning are going to be graduating in a couple of weeks? Would you stand please, the senior class, you're going to be graduating in a couple of weeks? God bless you guys, man. We love you. God bless you. And the other buildings, they're standing all up in the balcony. Let's give these seniors a big hand, will you? God bless you, seniors. It has, been, uh, it has been an event of a lifetime for me to, to see what God has done. What has happened has been a, a sovereign move of the Lord. To see a, a school founded that quickly, and now the school is buying that property. To have a thousand students in that school this quickly. All of these things are just absolute miracles. The last four and a half years have been absolutely wonderful. When we come up on this new millennium, I don't see any change at all. I, I see the revival continuing. I see the church continuing to grow, to be stronger and stronger. When I first came to Brownsville in 1982, February of 1982, and became the pastor, I said shortly thereafter, after I took the church, I'm not one that's given to visions. I can honestly say I probably haven't seen over two what I would call supernatural visions in my life. But I saw one here when I first came. And I told Brownsville about it then over in the chapel that morning after I saw it. I saw it on Sunday morning. And it was a, a literal supernatural vision that I saw. And I saw cars as far as the eye could see. And I have lived to see that vision come to pass because one night as I was coming into revival, on a Friday night, probably within a year after revival broke out here, I was coming in on a Friday night. It was in the summertime, and I saw the sun, the evening sun, glistening on the tops of those cars as far as the eye could see. And it was like the Lord just spoke in my spirit, and he said, see? He showed me that in 1982, and it came to pass in 1995, 1996. It was about 14 years later. And when I first came to Brownsville, the Lord, I believe, put into my spirit that he was going to do something powerful in this place. From the day that I got here, not because I was here by any means, but I just walked into it. It was already here. The prayer base was already here. I felt so honored and privileged to find a church where people were praying. I remember I talked to Carl Seitler and I talked to Elmer Melton back in those days, and they told me about how the church was praying. They'd been without a pastor for five months. They'd voted in a pastor at this church. Matter of fact, while I was talking to the board, they were talking to me about coming. I couldn't come. On the Sunday they wanted me to come, I had to call and cancel because I had a death, and I had to do a funeral. And I couldn't come that Sunday. So... My schedule wouldn't permit me to come on the other Sunday whenever they wanted me to come, and so they voted in another man. He got here before I did, and they voted him in. And so I just took it from the Lord. Well, God, you want me to stay where I am. You, just, you don't want me to go there. They called back in two days after they voted him in. and said, Pastor, he called back and said he couldn't take the church. He felt checked in his spirit about it. I've often wondered what that guy feels like today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He said he couldn't take the church. He felt checked in his spirit. And they said, well, you come down here and, and, and minister for us. And so we came down here. And from the time I came, it was just such a warm presence of the Lord. The prayer base was here. The people were here. And I met a nucleus of people that I will always love and remember to the day I die. It was just such a warm, close fellowship that God blessed us with. But whenever I came here, I made the statement within the first few weeks after being here that I could envision a church in Pensacola of 25,000 people. And even when I said that, I told the congregation that morning, I said, I can envision a church of 25,000 people, but 
Escambia County is so large that uh, that's just going to be a drop in the bucket compared to the, to the county the population. You know, I can envision this church running 25,000 people. I can see that clearly, more clearly today than I could back then. Matter of fact, I'm going to raise the number. Let's just go ahead and raise it up to 50,000. I can see it. I can see it. Listen, when things begin to pop, when God begins to move, and when things begin to happen prophetically, scriptures begin to be fulfilled, and, and the populace of this world begins to be real God conscious and prophecy conscious, churches are going to fill up. People's going to start running to God. I hope it works out like that. It may not work out like that, but I hope it does. But nonetheless, even with the cell group ministries that we have here in this church, it's just a matter of time before this thing just starts turning over and over and over and over and over and growing to be such a large church. There's a lot of churches that would not put up with that kind of talk because churches, there's a lot of mentalities of congregations that they want to keep that congregation small. They want to keep their pastor uh, exclusively for themselves. They want it to be just like a little club. They want every need to be catered to and waited on uh, specifically by the senior pastor. And uh, when you talk that kind of talk to a congregation, a lot of times they won't, they won't go for that because they like an exclusive little club and they call it church. But what God is doing today if we're going to effectively minister to the people that God is going to send to us, we're going to have to get out of that mindset. And we're going to have to let God give us plans and structures, which we're going to talk about some of those here yet today. Chaplain's going to come when I get through preaching this morning, and he's going to share some things that uh, he and I have discussed and that we're going to be implementing next year at Brownsville. But I can see God doing some powerful, awesome things in Pensacola. And I can tell you this too, friend, not only is God going to be doing powerful things in Pensacola, but God's going to be doing powerful things across America. Yes. Never before have I seen the populace of this nation as hungry for God as they are today. And that's good and it's bad. It's good because if there's good quality people out there of integrity that God has raised up, we can effectively minister to that hunger. But the charlatans and the money grabbers are out there also, and the deceivers. And uh, we need to really pray that God will let the hunger of America be satisfied in a powerful, scriptural, doctrinal way. But I see the revival going on next year. And uh, Steve Hill, we've talked extensively about, you know, what's going to happen. None of us knows what's going to happen. Uh, contrary to what we have talked about down through the years, we have still kept it to ourselves that we just, we monitor it month by month, quarter by quarter. We don't really uh, project a year in advance what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen. But we've often said that if the time ever came for the revival to change, that we would know it. And I don't see that change. Uh, matter of fact, we had one of the most powerful weeks of revival this week. We had overflow Friday night. We had overflow last night. And Steve preached one of the best sermons Friday night I've ever heard him preach. The stench of stagnation. It was an awesome message. If you didn't get that, you need to get it. Put on your steel-toed shoes before you listen to it. And then last night he preached on the rapture, his last message here at the Brownsville Revival for the 1900s. But I'm pleased to announce to you that we'll all be back in January. As a matter of fact, we'll all be back December the 31st to have another night of revival. <clears throat> And we want to encourage you to be here on December the 31st. We believe that God is going to move in a mighty way. Now listen clear carefully. We want you to come. Of all the people that we want to be here, we want our Brownsville people to be here. Now, I don't know how many people is going to come in from all over the world and all over America. I have a sense it's going to be very strong. Because Brenda and I, on the 31st of December, if we were not in revival here at Brownsville, we would be looking for a place somewhere if we were lay people, we would be looking for a place somewhere where God's moving. We would want to close out the 1900s and begin the year 2000 in the presence of God. And what better place to begin the year 2000 than here in the Brownsville Assembly of God Church? Amen? So we want you to come. We want you to be here and enjoy the 31st with us. The service that night on the 31st will start at 8 o'clock at night. 
And uh, we already have indications it's going to be a very strong night. We can accommodate about 6,000 people here on these premises. This building here, now we have the overflow across the street. It seats as many as this building does, if not a little bit more. And then we have the chapel, we have the cafeteria, the choir room, and we have the same setup as we had before. But we can probably squeeze about 5,500 to 6,000 people in here if we have that many people show up. And I wouldn't doubt but what we have that kind of a crowd on the 31st. But I wanted to say today that uh, as we close out, as, we, as Steve closed out his last message last night of the revival for 1900, and he preached on the rapture, uh, as I was sitting there listening to the message about the Lord coming, and I've preached it for many years and have believed it for many years that the Lord is coming very, very soon, I was sitting there thinking, well, Lord, if you came before we can get back here on the 31st or the 1st of January 2000, if you came, I just reminisced a little bit about my life and what God has done with Brenda and I and what he's done here at Brownsville. And I can honestly say if the Lord pulled me out of here, I have absolutely no regrets. It has been wonderful. This, the nicest people that God has let us meet, the nicest people that God has let us work with, and to let these eyes see and to let this flesh feel a move of God in our time, it has been worth it all. It's been worth every struggle. It's been worth every battle. Next year, uh, I'm going to change around a little bit from what my schedule was this last year. Next year, I believe, is going to be an awesome powerful year at the Brownsville Revival is going to continue on, no change. But I'm going to change my own personal schedule some next year because I'm going to focus more on Brownsville Assembly, but I'm also going to focus on our prayer crusades. Um, Lyndall, I want you to come up and join me. Lyndall and I met with Steve just um, a couple of weeks ago, about 10 days ago. And um, we, after a lot of prayer and deliberation, Lyndall felt that he needed a change in his schedule, and I'm going to let Lyndall tell you about that, and then I'll come back and tell you about the change in my schedule. But Lyndall, go ahead and uh, just tell everybody what God's been dealing with you about. Uh, well, as you know, the, the schedule of revival has been interesting. Um, you know, it's hard to stand on this stage and say it's hard because I haven't had to prepare a sermon every night, Steve. And uh, I haven't had to clean up a lot of the stuff that Pastor and Brother Robinson and Brother Barry and a lot of the pastors have to do. I know they do a lot of things uh, behind the scenes to keep things going. You just have no idea uh, when you come here how much behind the scenes goes on to keep things going. And uh, I came to a very difficult decision uh, about two two or three weeks ago at the end of the Monroe Crusade, uh, Awake America Crusade, because I'm a, I'm a mover. I like to do things. I like change. Uh, that's something Steve and I are a lot alike on. I like change. I hate the same old thing. And that I, it had to be a move of God for me to stay here this long <laughs> just to, you know what I'm saying, just to be here every single night and find myself excited to be here. And I still feel that way. Uh, back in 97, uh, we felt like that it was a good time to move out into crusades and, and, and Steve started doing crusades and Pastor and I went with him and blessed him and, and loved being a part of it. I enjoyed standing on the stage and watching those thousands of people come. When I got to the end of 1999, during our pastor's conference, I had full intentions of just continuing on next year with... Awake America Crusades and, and the church and the revival and everything because I love it. I am a, I, I'm a person that loves opportunity. Uh, I believe what Steve says, you must seize it while it's there because it don't always come around again. On uh, Wednesday morning of our pastor's conference, uh, I hit a bump, an emotional bump that I've never really dealt with before. And I'm not I don't think you could really call me a, a wimp after this long revival, but, but I hit a bump. And um, I sat down in the middle of my floor at my apartment 
And I, I found myself weeping, and I, and I just didn't know exactly why. And uh, later realized that it's just, I was just exhausted. Well, all of us are exhausted, and we all handle it differently. For six months or so, I've been thinking about what could I do to change next year. I started looking next year and just got tired. Before I even looked at it, I went, oh, brother. And then, but then I, the fire of revival and the desire to see souls saved was burning too. I don't know if any of you are going through that, if you've dealt with it. You got that desire to see people saved, but then you look down next year and go, Phew, can we do this another year? And uh, I, I, I come to a hard, hard decision for me. Uh, this year, Steve is going to be going into foreign crusades, which I love. If you'll recall, I was in foreign mission work when this revival broke, I was in the Ukraine doing ministry. I love going to foreign countries. I would rather be somewhere else than here. That's honest. When I come back to America, I'm not a good American because I have a world view of the church. The church is not American. The church is the world. God has called people all over the place. And uh, the church is bigger than what we think it is. And uh, when I get out there and see the hunger Steve understands what I mean. You don't want to come home. You just don't want to come home. You don't want to come home back to church again. You just go, man, get over there and thousands of people come and they're so hungry on the streets. You can stand up and preach and people just come. It's amazing. But I come to a decision that I didn't want to let my friend Steve down because I love you, Steve. I love Steve and Jerry. They're probably some of the dearest people in Amber and I's life. You've brought something to my life that... I'm amazed. I, I have a fire. You cleaned me up a little bit. Made me mad a few times. I went home and repented. But I appreciate you. But I decided that I, I needed to step down from doing Awake America Crusades. And the weight of that decision was very heavy because it meant saying goodbye to some things I really like. Matter of fact, I really love. But I also know that the Lord has been speaking to me in May or June of last year. The Lord spoke real hard to me and said, I want you to shut down for about five days and get alone with me. I have something to share with you. Now, I pray and seek the Lord daily and I talk to him and I, but there's a difference. There's a difference when you talk to the Lord every day and when you totally shut everything off. And everybody hears from the Lord in a different way. Steve is able to do it from 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 in the evening. Pastor does it his way. You do it your way. When I came to Brownsville, the way I heard the word of the Lord for me is I shut my phone off, closed my blinds, and dug my nose in the carpet. I'm an old-time Pentecostal. That's what we do, and we really want to hear from the Lord. You have to get all the distractions to shut down. And I did that. I felt the Lord saying that to me again, and I made a week, set it aside, had someone offer me a place to go, and it turned into a major disaster. And it didn't work, and I just kept pushing it off, going, well, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Till I got to the end of this year, and I said, Lord, I need a fresh word from you. Not only do I need a fresh word from you, there's songs you want me to write, I don't have time to write them. There's songs, there's, there's things that God's speaking to me, and they're all in fragments on my hard drive at home, because there's no time to sit down and do it. And I looked at next year and realized all the traveling I would do, so I chose to take a block of, of commitment and back away from it. And so that's what I've done. Now, there has been no falling outs. We haven't had any slug fights. We're not mad at each other. I don't think Steve, matter of fact, I know that I've put you, I've put Steve and his organization into an odd spot. Uh, and I'm uncomfortable with that. But I know what I need to do. Now, a lot of times people outside of this church are going to say, but you, you're still going to do prayer crusades with pastor. Well, pastor's going to do maybe six. I'm going to do a couple of them. I don't know that I'll do all of them. Uh, I have one other commitment for the first quarter of the year, and that's it. I'm doing my best to shut down. I'll be at Revival. I'll be here Friday and Saturday night and Sunday morning. I'll be a part of this. But I sense that there's a change coming. And... And it's time for change. It's time for, for change for me personally. I want to have a fresh word coming into the new millennium. 
I don't think next year is going to be any different than any other year in that sense, except that I know God is doing something. And I want to, I want to put myself in a position. Now, that doesn't mean that working with Steve doesn't mean God's doing something. It's just I think it's a decision that I need to make. And Steve has been supportive of me, Jerry, Pastor, and uh, they've been just princes. And I don't know how long I'm going to be shut down. I may get four or five months in the year and realize I'm ready. Here we go. And, uh, but I feel like just right now, starting, we need to do this. And that's my explanation, Pastor. <laughs> that's my official explanation. <laughs> One thing. One thing I did want to say, and this is a plug for Pastor Kerry and Pastor Kilpatrick. Church, I, I know that, that, that Brownsville is trying some new things that are uncomfortable maybe in the beginning, initially. They're trying some things with grace groups, and I know some of the old timers, that's hard for you to fathom because you've always been used to a church that was program based, and I think that's going to continue on at Brownsville. But hear me. I'm telling you, it's so funny. I was sharing with Pastor this week. I called him up and I said, Pastor, I just want to tell you what I really get excited about. And he said, well, what's that? I said, I get excited about churches that are in homes where there's 60 or 70,000 people and they can't even meet at a building. There's no building big enough in town. And when they finally do meet a couple of times a month or so to, to, to talk about and worship together, that the town goes, I had no idea there were that many believers in town. I believe that in the coming years, that's going to be us. And I want to encourage those of you, that doesn't mean you're going to do away with what you know, but listen, look ahead and realize that this thing, what God wants to do is massive. And when I, I was telling pastor about it, he goes, you know, I've been thinking about that since the 70s. I go, well, I hear I'm, it takes me a while to catch up, but I finally... <laughs> If you'll uh, permit me just another few moments here, and we're going to move on with the service. But let me just tell you something. It's just, I'm, I'm just burning with it. My first responsibility to God is Brownsville Assembly. That's, that's where I'm called to. And I want to make it real clear this morning to everybody that I, I don't ever have any plans. I have no intentions. I have no vision of ever doing what I'm trying to do for the Lord outside of this church without being the pastor of this church. God is, uh, has, I believe, laid his hand on me and raised me up to first of all and foremost be the senior pastor, the federal headship and the covering of Brownsville Assembly. That's my first priority. And I want to make this real clear today. If there's anything that needs to be dealt with in this church, you don't know it, but I deal with situations all the time that you, ne you never know anything about. And uh, Steve doesn't know about m most of the things that I deal with, but I deal with them constantly. And if there's a problem, if there's troubleshooting that has to be done, I'm still not afraid to do it, never been afraid to do it, and I'm not afraid to do it today. If there's trouble in the church, I've always been the type of a pastor that I deal with it head on. I don't let it go. When I hear about it, when I hear about it, it's when your phone will ring. I don't let it go. Never have let it go. I don't say that braggadociously. I'm just saying that's the way God made me. If there's a problem, we'll deal with it head on. If I need to repent, if I've done something wrong, I'll repent. And I expect you, if you've done something wrong, for you to repent too. Because, you know, friend, I don't believe at unity in any cost. I believe in unity, but I don't believe in unity at any cost. Because there's some people we don't need. And the people that we don't need is people that don't want to move with the Lord. They don't want to have a good spirit. They're divisive, contentious, and troublemakers. And I've always dealt with it, and I will always deal with it. A lot of times people see me on the platform. I'm not real vocal in this revival. And uh, people come in and they want to become a part of the church. They see me a lot in the revival. There's many nights I don't even say a word at my own request. I don't need to. Even when we go off at Awake Americas, 
I take the pulpit very seldom. Not during the day sessions when I have my session, but I take the pulpit very seldom. I've never been one to hog a microphone, never been one to want to be seen or want to be heard. But um, uh, when you see me on the platform, many of these people coming in that wants to become a part of the church, they see me quiet. Uh, they see me uh, probably happy and pastoral. But I also want you to know, and I want this church to know, that I love being pastoral. But if I can't be pastoral, I will be disciplinarian. I've always been and always will be. And I believe that's one of the reasons why God has let his blessings flow in this place is because he knows there's a man here that won't put up with trouble. I won't tolerate junk. I never have and I never will. And so just because you see me on the platform quiet, don't let that deceive you, friend. Uh, I will deal with trouble if I have to. And so my first responsibility is this church. But God has also, uh, I believe, put his hand on me to do some, some powerful things outside this church. And what I'm saying about this, everybody, please hear me closely. What I'm talking about doing, when I traveled with Steve and we went to Awake America Crusades, Steve Hill's ministry headed that up. It was Awake America Crusades. And I loved it, and God gave me great opportunities there to meet a lot of wonderful people and to minister to a lot of preachers. But this year, I also am pulling away from Awake Americas. I will be doing some with Steve, the ones that he really needs me on. I'll be doing some with him. But I'm going to plan about six prayer crusades this year, one every other month somewhere in the nation. The first one is going to be January the 31st and February the 1st in Little Rock, Arkansas. We've had... We've had, a, we've had an outbreak of the Holy Ghost there in Little Rock, and uh, we're going back there for our first prayer crusade. And I know that there's powerful pastors all over Little Rock, and they don't need me. And uh, God is going to touch Arkansas with or without me. But uh, he's given a special favor there for right now, and our first prayer crusade is going to be in Little Rock. But let me tell you something that really has excited me. Will you all listen to me a minute? Let me tell you something that's really excited me. When God first gave me the, the idea and the concept of prayer in Brownsville before revival broke out, I remember I was so excited. You ever gone over a hill real quick and you sort of, your stomach sort of turns? That's the way I felt whenever God gave me the concept of prayer in this church before revival broke out. I'd, I'd, I'd ride around or be in my house and my stomach would turn like that and I would just feel so giddy and excited. I feel that now doubly what I did before revival broke out of Brownsville. I feel that doubly. Sometimes it'll almost take my breath. I got to where I can't sleep. I get up and go to the restroom in the middle of the night, come back, lay down, and my mind gets to turning. And boy, I mean, it's just, it's turning out some good stuff. And uh, we're going to do some different banners outside the church. And this is going to be specifically for Coliseums. These banners are going to be about the size of that opening right there in that balcony, that baptistry, that big opening there. They're going to be huge. And um, we're going to have to have some Hercules to carry the thing around, you know. But anyway, let me, tell you, let me tell you some banners that the Lord has given me. We're going to change. These banners are going to be visuals. They're not going to be like the banners we have here. They're going to be big visuals in color. And um, one of the banners that the Lord has given me is like a school's banner. We're going, to, we're going to stay with the schools, but we're going to change it up. Some of these banners are going to have front and back. And on the front of the, one of these banners is going to have a student sitting behind a desk in school. And around him are going to be words like suicide, drugs, alcohol, fornication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. just going to surround him. That's what kids go through in school. You flip the banner over, and it shows a rear view of Jesus walking up the steps to a high school. We're going to have a banner where instead of having a pastor's banner, we're going to have a five-fold gift, giftings banner. It'll say ministers, but it'll have pastors, teachers, apostles, evangelists, and prophets. And uh, it'll show a very authoritative, powerful hand holding the Word of God. And as that Word of God is being held up, it has light coming from it. It's chasing the darkness away. We're going to have a unity banner, which will probably be brought out last. 
and it, on one side of the banner it will say, Tearing Down the Walls. And it will have a big chunk of wall flying up in the banner, and it will say, Racism. Another big chunk flying off of that wall will say, Denominationalism. You flip the banner over, and it says, Unity, and it shows God's people together. Now, let me... Go ahead. <laughs> Woo! Shout! And we got a new warfare banner. Uh, we've got this unity banner. We got a banner of healing where it shows Jesus being strapped, his wrist being strapped and stretched out and laid down. And it shows a Roman soldier taking that whip. And it shows his back bloody and ripped like rose in a field. And it shows that Roman soldier standing there with those tassels, getting those tassels ready to put another lick on his back. And the name of that banner, banner will be healing. And down at the bottom it says, by his stripes we're healed. You know what? I got another idea that the Lord gave me. Man, I'm so excited about this. Y'all pardon me this morning. I can't help it. I just can't help it. Shoo, you fool me, folks. I'll run. I, I feel good. But I, I, the Lord gave me this, too. I believe the Lord gave it to me. If he didn't, I'm going to give him the credit for it. Uh, <laughs> the other night, I was laying there in the wee hours of the morning wide awake, and, and I got this idea. When we bring the banners in, I want to take some kids with me from, from Brownsville, from uh, Master's Commission, Richard, maybe even some from BRSM. But I want to take our youth group that's been in discipleship, our Master's Commission, and let them go with me and do dramas. And for example, <clears throat> when that banner comes out at the end on Unity, have a big styrofoam wall built. And on the front of the wall that the crowd will see, how United Methodists, Southern Baptists, Assemblies of God, Charismatics, Church of the Brethren, Wesleyans, you know, how all the names of the different denominations on the front of that big styrofoam wall. And then when we pray for the walls to come down, have those kids line up with their arms locked and let them march through like an army and bust that wall down. <laughs> Hallelujah! Woo! And then on the school's banner, when the school's banner comes out, have a bunch of kids and up on the stage, have them all sitting in desk. And have an audio going for the Coliseum crowd to hear where it says, why don't you just kill yourself? You're nobody anyway. Your mom and dad's divorced. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares whether you live or die. Why don't you just take your life? See that chick over there? Boy, isn't she sharp, you know. And, and all these words coming out over the audio and show these students sitting there and all these words coming out over the audio, but then all of a sudden let the scene change on the stage and let that big picture of a high school appear and let it show Jesus walking into that high school. Friend, I don't know if you believe this or not, but I believe God is on the way back to our schools. Listen, hear me. If God's people will pray and seek the face of God, if we'll get serious about the things of God, God is going to turn America around. Prayer will turn America around. I said prayer will turn America around. Woo! Oh, hallelujah! Listen, if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight, how many can ten thousand put to flight? I have a dream. Oh, that sounded good, didn't it? That was not intended. I have a dream. Yeah, sounds good. I've got a dream where denominational tags are going to fall off. Where people will get together. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in cities before we arrive there for the prayer crusade. I'm going to go at my own expense. I'm going to meet with all the local pastors that will come. And I'm going to tell them that I want them to come and join us in prayer. It's not because we're there. They can do the same thing themselves. If any of them wants to cheer and do the prayer crusade, I'll step aside and let them lead in the prayer crusade. But I'm going to meet with the pastors and ask them to come and bring their congregations with them. And the pastors that don't come, I'm going to stay over an extra day. And I'm going to go around knocking on their doors. I'm going to visit their churches, and I'm going to go and knock on their doors. The black churches, the Asian churches, all of them, I'm going to knock on the doors, and I'm going to say, look, we missed you at the meeting yesterday, but I want to come here and personally give an invitation to come and bring your congregation. This is not about John Kilpatrick. This is not about Brownsville Assembly. This is about getting your city together and praying for a move of God. 
And I believe that God is going to give us favor. And I believe what God did in this church in prayer before he brought revival, I can feel the same thing. I, sh I feel it. Whew. I feel that God is about to give a mighty outpouring of his spirit in this nation. And if we can get people praying, I'm telling you, if we can forget our denominational tags, and if we can get the blacks and the whites together and the Asians together, and we can all come together under a banner of united in prayer, that's what we're going to call these crusades, united in prayer. And if we can get God's people together and get them praying, get them, uh, you know, to drop all these petty differences and pride and arrogances and walls down and get us together, have some mighty praise and worship, and then go right into praying, I believe that God is going to send revival in this nation like you cannot believe. Friend, I believe that. On the repentance banner, which is going to be the first banner that we bring out, it's called repentance banner. It's going to have up at the top in big letters, repentance. And then it's going to have a person bent over praying. And then it's going to say, uh, Jesus, I have sinned. Please forgive me. That's going to be the first banner that's going to be brought out. There's, there's so many others that I could talk about. We're going to have 14 banners that we're taking with us. They're all going to be powerful. They're going to be big visuals. And I just sense that God is going to really move. But friend, I, I really want you to pray for us that God will, will help us. I know we're going to come under attack because hell hates prayer. I know we're going to come under attack. I've already counted the cost. I don't know what the cost is going to be, but I'm ready to pay that cost, whatever the cost may be, for us to have a move of God, to do what we can to help people to have a move of God in their churches and in their cities. And so I'd like you to pray for us, but more than pray for us, is, well, I mean, let me say equally as much as praying for us, I, I need your, your moral support. I don't want you to sit out there and start backbiting and talking to one another and saying, well, he's, he's not here like he was, and he's doing this and he's doing that. You need to thank God your pastor's out there that has a burden and a vision for the world. You need to thank God for that. And we got, yeah, go ahead. I want to, while, while he's up here talking about these crusades, let you know uh, the effect that Brownsville has had on the world. Now, we're, we're, we're thrilled that three and a half million people have come through this church, but the Assemblies of God, those of you that have not seen the poster that they published at the General Council, they, po they, they printed a poster that, that had to do with 100 years of the Assemblies of God from the beginning from Azusa Street to now. And it started, the poster starts with Azusa, and at the end of the century is Brownsville. Now, you don't understand, I hope you do understand, but many of you don't understand the impact of that. They're putting this revival, this powerful revival, on the same page as Azusa. And they, and they have recognized this, that this revival has turned churches upside down, that millions have been saved. But I want to tell you something, with that comes a responsibility. Because I'm not one to, to die out in the 1900s. You know, there's something more coming up. And I don't believe God takes us, I don't think we're heading down the steps. I believe we're heading towards us from glory to glory, and there's more. And you've got to imagine, and I, I tell you, this man of God right here, what you're hearing is vision. This is vision. And without a vision, friend, this country's going to go down the tubes. And when I hear, you know, he's planning six crusades, and I know four of them are really in the works, and two of them are maybe iffy, but, you know, a six crusades, um, you know, that's, that's a hand, uh, how long are the crusades? Two days? Two days. What is that? Twelve days out of the year 2000. Some of us in this room that can do it, you need to join him at those crusades. You do. If you, and some of them are close. Little Rock's not a long way off. Join him. Join him and be there, friend, because this is the very thing that can turn this nation around. One of the problems, Pastor, we're having with the Awake Americas is churches don't get along. They don't get along. The black pastor will come and hug my neck. The Asian pastor will come hug my neck. The... The Hispanic pastor will hug my neck. The, all, the, all these pastors will hug my neck, but when it comes time for the crusade, their people won't show up. And there's something wrong. 
there's something wrong. And I believe these prayer crusades, this is where it starts, friend, right here. So I just want to tell you, Pastor, I'm excited about it. Uh, Lyndall mentioned uh, something a minute ago about our foreign crusades. We're only handling a few of those next year uh, because I cannot do all that traveling either. Foreign crusades will just wear you to a frazzle. And so uh, a lot of what you're hearing, we have tucked in to those few days at the beginning of the week when we're not here in revival. And it'll wear you out, friend, but this is harvest time. This is harvest time. And I, the Lord is looking at it. When I just, there's so much on my heart right now because when, when Pastor shared about the 40,000, 50,000, 25,000 members in the church, I believe Brownsville wants that. And you're wondering how. There's nothing to it, friend. How many were at the baptism two Friday nights ago when, when they baptized a cell group here? Some of you weren't. It had blown your mind. They baptized a cell group, all these brand new members of Brownsville Assembly that you don't know, one after another were being baptized. They were all saved, not at revival, That's right. but in a home cell group, in, a, in, in one of these grace groups. And I was watching this, families that were saved. And I'm going, God, I'm not a mathematician, but any bozo can add this up. You get 500 to 1,000 cell groups going out there, friend, you're going to win a city just like that. Because people know people, and they're a whole lot easier for them to go to a house than to come to this monstrosity church that scares them half to death. So God's up to something, friend. The year 2000 is going to be phenomenal. And I want to ask you one more question in the, in the overflow and right here. How many are planning on being here for December 31st? Raise your hand. We need to accommodate for 6,000 people. There's no doubt about it. And so, um, hallelujah. You may need to come on December 30th to get a seat. <laughs> hallelujah. How many of you would like to go with me on, on <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Choir, y'all going. Hey, get your hand up right now. Get it up, everybody. Those that don't have their hand up, reach over and slap them across the face. No, I'm kidding. No. How many of you would like to go on some of these prayer crusades? How many of you will go on the prayer crusade in Little Rock? Let me see your hand. Great, great, great. Wonderful, wonderful. I believe we're going to have an outbreak of the Spirit of God in Little Rock. And then the next one's going to be in Minneapolis. The third one's going to be in Denver. We uh, are going to be going to um, the East Coast, and then we're going to be going to Los Angeles. They've invited us to come. And so we're going to have some powerful, powerful prayer crusades and um I know that the Lord is in it. Before we move on in the service this morning and before I bring the message, I wanted to say to you today that um, I can't tell you how much um, I have respect and deep love and appreciation for Steve and Jerry Hill. We are concluding the 1900s here at this church and here in the revival with Steve. God has sent him here and has used him in a mighty way to, I feel, um, turn the churches in this nation and probably the world upside down with his in-your-face repentance preaching. I want to say one other thing t today, too, before I, before I progress on here a little bit. I want everybody to look this way and listen to me. God uses people, and every person that God uses is flawed. The man talking behind this microphone right now is major flawed. I'm not in sin, but I've got flaws. I know my weaknesses. I know my strengths. I live with my wife for 31 years. She knows my weaknesses. She knows my strengths. I'm her pastor. I'm also her husband, but she knows my flaws and my strengths. I know Steve Hill's strengths, and I know some of his weaknesses. But you know, when God calls a man and raises him up and sends him to preach, when they first come in like a pastor comes in behind a pulpit, he's fresh and new, everybody looks at that man almost like he's perfect. And they look at the guy behind the pulpit and they say, now boy, there's a man of God, so forth, so on. 
But then after they come for two or three months, six months, a year, two years, three years, and then the flaws are evident, which God knew was there when he called the man, me or him or anybody else. But you have a chance to learn those flaws. Once a person, once a Christian sees a flaw in a man of God, be it an evangelist, pastor, or whatever, we have a tendency to lose something and to want to drift back and start looking for another perfect man of God. Do you know there's churches that have gone through bushels of preachers down through the years looking for a perfect preacher? And those churches have been set back for decades because they've been looking for the perfect preacher. I think it's about time that the church begins to accept who God sends us and back him. And that's the same way it is with an evangelist. We hear him night after night. We hear this in-your-face repentance preaching. Some of you here at Brownsville might have said to yourself, well, I'm saved. I don't need that. Oh. You need it more than you know. And you also don't realize that that kind of preaching helps spray this congregation constantly, keep us, get all the grime and pollution of the world off of us. And by the time we come in here on Sundays, we're so in touch with the Lord and the Spirit of God that we just have great Sunday services. But a lot of times we don't ever think to thank the man that God used to do that. And today I want to come before you and I want to say to you, Brenda, I want you to join me up here for a minute, honey. I want to say before you today that um, I want to receive an offering today for Steve and Jerry. Not only for them personally, but I want to receive an offering for their ministry. And you might say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, why are you doing this? Come on up here, baby. You might say, well, well why are you doing this? Because um, usually the offering that I receive for Steve is always on a Friday night. And a lot of you Brownsville people are never here on Friday night, so you don't have a chance to give to his ministry. But I want you to give this morning. Now listen, before you reach for your wallet, just listen to me a minute. I want you to give today because I feel like it would be wrong of me to end up this year and end up this decade, this millennium, and not say thank you in a tangible way to Steve and Jerry. Now, up until last Friday night, the last three offerings on Friday night has been the poorest that they have been probably in, in I guess, about the history of the revival. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, a lot of people are busy. A lot of Y2K fears. A lot of different things going on. But the offerings were very poor. This last Friday night, I was hoping for the offering to be a lot better than what it was. It was decent, but it wasn't what it should be. It wasn't up to par. Well, Steve is going to be off the whole month of December. And I know that, um, that they have just made a loan of their ministry. And that, I'm not pulling your leg, friend. They made a, they made a loan because they are running tight. You might say, well, he takes in the offering here on Friday night, he travels on the way, come here. You don't understand the expenses. You don't understand how much it takes to do what is being done. It takes a lot of money. If you as a layperson would see some of the figures, your eyes would probably pop open. You'd think, oh my God, they're getting rich. You don't understand the costs that there are. But Steve has just taken out a loan a few weeks ago for his ministry, about two weeks ago for his ministry, to try to help him make it through December because he's going to be with his family and get much needed and much deserved rest for the month of December. And he's going to be with Jerry and his children, and he won't have that hanging over him of getting those sermons every day. And it's a lot of pressure. Believe me, friend, you don't know the pressure. And Steve, I wanted to say today to you in front of all these people and the overflow and and all of us, I, I just think that some voice needs to articulate to you personally that we love you. And most of us in this room don't know the price that you paid and the soldier that you have been. But I have the greatest of admiration for you, Steve Hill. I know you and I've been with you. I have the greatest admiration for him. Steve is a powerful evangelist that God has laid his hand on and used and he's going to continue to use. I have the greatest admiration for him. I've been with him all these years, and I still love him and admire him. And um, I think that the least that we can do today at Brownsville is to receive an offering. Now, they're going to, they've just moved into their house that they've just built. 
Their house is not an extravagant house by any means. It's certainly not a mansion, but it's a nice home. It's the first one that Steve and Jerry has had. They've sold out many times all of their furnishings down to the pictures on the wall and picked up and followed the will of God as it's taken them to different places even around the world. They've sold out at the drop of a hat down to the bare walls to follow the will of God. Now, for the first time in their married life, Steve and Jerry is making a decent enough salary to where they can begin to enjoy some things together. And the month of December is one of those months that they don't have any pressures on them now, and they can really enjoy one another and enjoy their family and do some things they've always wanted to do. And I feel the mantle on my shoulders this morning to stand here as the pastor and say that Brenda and I are going to be the first to give in this offering, and we're going to make it substantial. I told Steve I wanted to, because they're, they're having to buy new furniture for their house. And I told Steve that I wanted, we wanted to buy him a new bedroom suit for his, for his new home. I know the one they've looked at, and I know how much it costs. And I would like for Brownsville to be able to buy that bedroom suit with money left over to go in their ministry to help them make it through the month of December. Brent, I think you want to say something. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I just wanted to say thanks to Steve, too. Uh, you know, I was touched before revival. I went to Toronto and was touched mightily up there. And I had intimacy with the Lord for four months. And during this time, uh, Steve called, and he had been touched in London at Holy Trinity Brompton. And uh, he was powerfully touched. So it was one uh, fellow talking to this girl and telling me, you know, over the phone what God had done for him. And we were so excited and we had got Pastor on the phone and, and Pastor says, well, Steve, come and share what God's doing. And, and so he said, come Father's Day. That was the only day you remember that, Steve. And we had a wonderful talk over the phone, and I was so excited, and I was over the revival banner, and I was telling the people around my banner, I said, you don't want to miss Father's Day night. Please come. Steve Hill's coming, and God's touched him. I don't know what God's going to do. And I really had no idea what God was going to do, but I knew it was going to be a good thing. But... And early on when Pastor was down and, and he was out four hours and, and that day Steve said, Brenda, go with me. Jerry was not here at that time. And he said, go with me and pray with me. And so we took these claws and I would throw them over the different people and we were just, you know, out praying and it was wonderful. And Steve would have words for people and I knew those people and I knew you and uh, Steve was right on when he'd give words to them. And I said, boy, they needed that. And it was awesome. And, you know, I was following him around week after week. And um, he would holler out. He would say, he's here. Go after him, folks. Get in. Go after him. And I think, Steve, we know he's here. What, why do you keep saying that? And it was over here in, in uh, this aisle, going up the back here, that I was with Steve again. And he was saying that again. He said, he's here, folks. Go after him. Go after him. And I knew what Steve was saying when he said that because remember the thing that came through pastor's legs? We said that it was the presence. It was the river of God. For the first time, I felt the river come down that aisle and it literally pushed me backwards. It took my breath away and I said, oh, 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 and I felt it push me. And it was such an awesome presence. So I knew what Steve Hill was feeling and when he would say that. But Steve, I want to tell you thank you from my heart because you don't know how God used you in my life. Many of the Brownsville people, the old Brownsville people, know that I did not like to come up behind the pulpit. You know, my husband would drag me up here, but I was very reluctant. I was, you know, bashful and shy. <laughs> and I just hated it. And I just, you know, it was pride. Can I tell you that? Self-consciousness, the Lord has showed me, is nothing but pride. And so now I'm a willing, uh, willing to be a fool for his name. <laughs> Namesake. But anyway, Steve at the beginning of the revival says, Brenda, I want you to take testimonies. And I said, oh, Steve, I don't know if I can do that, you know. And I knew God had touched me, 
But so I was willing to do that. And I said, okay. And then I, about, you know, two or three nights into the revival, you know, of taking the testimonies, I, I knew somebody else could do a better job than I. I I'm not real spontaneous and quick. And so I, I came back to Steve. I said, Steve, get somebody else. I said, I don't want to let you down. I said, you're so up. You know how he is. He's just like this all the time. And I said, I don't want to, you know, make, uh, pull the service down. And I said, just get somebody else. He said, no, Brenda, you're going to do this. And, you know, I appreciate you doing that and pushing me because it has helped me and enabled me now that I go out speaking. I go to all over the world and go in different cities, and I'm so comfortable now doing what I do. I'm not afraid anymore. And uh, I just thank you for pushing me forward, and, and he's got a part in my life for sure. Thanks a lot, Steve. You and Jerry are a blessing to this church. I, you know, friend, we've reached a place now to where there's probably not really much else to say, but I feel like there's a responsibility on us this morning to bless this man and his wife. I love Steve and Jerry. Always have. I always have. From the first time I ever met him, I always loved him. Before I even met him, I, I loved him when I first saw him. And I, it has been the best four and a half years of my life. And so I want to bless Steve and Jerry this morning. Listen, I know that you're probably sitting out there thinking, well, we, get, we need money for a lot of other places. That's true. That's true. But I feel like if we'll honor the man of God, God will take care of these other situations. I really believe that. So would you help me today in this offering? Boy, be a good one. I want it to be a good one. I want to ask you to come and usher us. Go ahead and come and we're going to look to the Lord here. Go ahead and be getting your checkbooks and making out your checks. <clears throat> Benny? I want you to come up here and pray with this offering, son. Ask the Lord to bless this offering out of your heart. Father, thank you for the sweet presence of the Lord this morning. We just ask you right now, Father, to consider your servant, consider his heart consider the motivation of his heart lord consider his family consider the uh, the sacrifice the pain and the toil consider the uh, the work that has been done lord i just ask you right now to consider also the the need and the um the things that are needed for these coming days and brother steve and jerry we just ask you lord to um, uh, compel the hearts of our congregation lord to give out of their hearts and love and appreciation lord to give generously and liberally and we bless our brother today and his family in the name of the lord thank you amen God bless you. Over in the Family Life Center, Usher is going to be coming by and getting your offering also. Lindell, bless you, buddy. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. Thank you, Lord. I just want to just want to take a little time. I just want to take a little time right now and say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. I just want to take a little time right now and say thank you. For all you've done for me, thank you, thank you, Lord. I just
just want to thank you. As they finish the offering, there's just a brief announcement. Um, December 19th, as you know, next week we'll be meeting in the Family Life Center. December 19th, the, uh, the choir, somehow over in that building, we're going to be doing some music, uh, a lot of music that morning about Christmas. It's not a cantata by any means. But we thought it might be nice just to get together on the 19th as a church and just sing some songs and celebrate the coming of the Lord. What do you think? You think that'd be all right? So just want to make sure you know about that and uh, come and be a part of it. God bless you. And now God's man of faith and power for the hour. <laughs> wanted to do that. <laughs> I always knew if somebody ever did that, I'd be speechless. <laughs> <laughs> For 30 minutes, I'm going to preach. <laughs> you think I'm joking, don't you? Well, I better get started. <clears throat> Go to James. No, it's fine. It'll be fine. Hold on, priest. Chaplain's going to come in just a moment. I've been dealing with the subject of accepting adversity. I've changed the title of it. I'm going, to, I'm going to entitle it Embracing Adversity. The Lord said, Jesus said, see that you resist not evil. And what he's saying there is, if you resist evil, if you resist adversity, if you resist what people are doing to you, you're probably going to miss God, not saying that God is doing it to you, but that God is allowing it. There's a purpose behind it. God has a sovereign purpose for everything that he does. Now listen, I'm not going to be going that long this morning, so I want everybody's attention. I want as little moving in and out as possible. I don't want to have to preach to a traveling congregation, so please, let's honor that. If you've got to go, go ahead and go now, but don't be going in the next 30 minutes, please. I appreciate it. In order to accept adversity, it means that you're going to have to have some kind of understanding about what's happening to you. I'll just cover this real quickly because I've already touched on it one time before. But the Bible says, Jesus told the disciples, he said, see to it that you resist not evil. When they came to arrest Jesus, the Bible said that Peter pulled out his sword and he resisted what was about to happen. He pulled out his sword and he was going to defend the Lord. He was going to resist what was happening. To make a long story short, by Peter's very resistance, by pulling his sword, he failed. He wasn't with the Lord when he was crucified. He got into fear. He ran. He cursed. He betrayed the Lord, he went under. Had Jesus not come back to him after Jesus' resurrection and restored Peter, it would have been a fiasco. But Jesus in his mercy came back to Peter and restored him, just like the Lord has been gracious to restore you and I in our times of failure. 
But notice Jesus did not resist the adversity. He yielded to it. And he overcame the devil. He overcame his enemies. He overcame the world. He overcame death. He came back triumphant because he accepted the adversity. The Bible says in James, verse 2, my brethren count it all joy. Look at verse 2, chapter 1. My brethren, he's talking about Christians there. He's not writing to the heathen. He said, my brethren, my brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord, he said, count it all joy when you fall into different trials. That word there, temptations, actually means trials. He said, count it all joy when you fall, not you plan to go into them, but when you fall into different trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith will work patience, and let patience have her perfect work. It says, allow patience to have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now. Here's what verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. God gives it to all men liberally, abrades not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, etc., etc. Now look this way, everybody. The Bible says it's talking about different trials, and it's talking about temptations. It's talking about falling into things that's unexpected. And then the most natural thing that Paul talks about here is, or James talks about here is he's talking about um, patience, but then he goes right into wisdom. If you embrace if you embrace adversity, you truly embrace it and receive it. God will give you wisdom. If you reject the adversity, you're going to become stubborn. You're going to become stiff-necked. You're going to become incorrigible. Like, a, like a, a person that once was a disciple, but then now they pull the shoulder back. They think they know more than the master. And you move in your own little world. You take yourself out of the big picture. You take yourself out of the sovereignty of God. That type of a person has a string of failures in his life or her life. There's a string of failures. There's a stubbornness and a rigidness that develops in a person like that. They're hard to get along with, broken relationships all along the way because they always try to resist and do things their own way. Bible says embrace it, God will give you wisdom, and God will bring you through. Now I want you to listen to something. When the devil comes against you to attack you, he has four things in mind. I'm going to refresh you on these four things in mind. Listen to them carefully. The devil has four things in mind when he comes to attack you. The first thing he's got in mind is he wants you to become offended with God. How many people have had adversity come in their life? They were offended because God allowed that adversity to come in their life. They didn't feel like daddy took up for them. They didn't feel like daddy deflected that trouble and let them escape. They didn't think that daddy would let their name be soiled or that daddy would let them go through that terrible, long, drawn-out thing. And the devil wants to so cause things to come your way to cause you to be offended with God. If he could ever get you offended with God, Here's what happens, number two. He seeks to end your fellowship with God by getting you to sin when offense comes. If the devil can get you to break intimacy and fellowship with the Lord, where you talk to him, if you quit talking to God, you quit praying, and you quit corresponding with the Lord through his word, the most natural result is going to be that you're going to get in sin. So if you get offended with God and you break fellowship with God, it means you're going to get into sin. So the devil is accomplishing his purposes. But the third thing that he's trying to do, he's trying to halt the development of Christian character in your life 
by tempting you to avoid that adversity because that's the way character is developed. How many of God's people today in the church have no character and they've been serving God 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, 30 years, they have no character. It's because they have resisted and they would not let grace work in their life, wouldn't let the Holy Spirit work in their life, wouldn't let patience have its way to make them entire, wanting nothing, and they don't have wisdom. They open their mouth and they're offensive. What you thought would come out of their mouth should be grace and loving understanding and giving you good God and counsel and talking to you in a sweet way and saying, son, I know where you are, but oh, my Lord will help you. I know some people have been serving God for years. You come up to them and talk to them about something you're going through and they almost spew out bitterness and venom. Why? Because they would not accept what God did, wouldn't let the patience work and they didn't get any wisdom. Number four, the devil wants to prevent you from enjoying the fruit of overcoming your adversity. In other words, he wants to cheat you out of your testimony. You know, there's so many Christians today that does not have testimony. You know why? Because they failed every test that has come their way. They have no testimony. Have nothing to talk about. All they'll talk about is how bad folks does them. All they'll talk about is how bad life has been to me. Isn't life... You know the, the, the term they use. In life, uh, that's what they say. And a lot of God's people is the same way. I've heard ministers talk the same way. Oh, church people, I don't church, trust, trust, trust church people. Oh, church people, they'll stab you in the back. Oh, this, oh, that. They're bitter, they're hurt. They didn't embrace that adversity. And also, let me, let me take you back real quickly. You remember... In the scriptures where I took you first, where it was talking about David and Shimei. The Bible says that David was running from Absalom, his son. He was running in dejection. He was dejected by the people. Absalom had won the hearts of David's cohorts and his people that he ruled over and reigned over as king. And David is running for his life. Here comes Shimei while David is running for his life. Shimei is up there at the top of the hill cursing David, throwing dust at him and throwing rocks at him and cussing him. Just cussing him out. Abishai said to David, you want me to kill him and me take his head off? And David said, no, 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 no. Your son of Zariah, don't you know? He said, be quiet. He said, the Lord is letting this man curse me. And when David said that, what David was saying is, I'm embracing this. I'm embracing this adversity. He said, who knows? God has allowed him to curse me. Who knows? Maybe God will work something on my behalf. It's almost like as soon as David was willing to accept what was happening to him, it was a terrible sight. Man up there throwing dust, throwing rocks, cursing like a wild maniac. And David's running for his life from his own son. He's in humiliation anyway. That's when the devil will attack you. I want you to listen to me, friend. When it seems like things can't get any worse, the devil will have a shimmy up there cursing you. You know why? He wants to push you over the edge. You know why he wants to push you over the edge? To cheat you out of what God's got for you. And the Bible says... But David said, it could be. He said, no, 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 no. We're going to accept this. The Lord, I believe, has allowed this. And as soon as David said that, it's like he got revelation. Wisdom came as soon as he embraced that adversity. And he says, God's going to work something for me. And then the Bible says, I don't have time to go through all the scriptures, but you remember what the Bible says. It says that David and his men refreshed himself there in the midst of that terrible adversity. They refreshed themselves. How many of you know there is a place of refreshing and sometime it's right in the presence of your enemies? Psalms 23. He prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. The devil has got your enemies surrounding you. They're cursing you. They hate you. They want to see you come to naught. But God says, no, I'm not going to take you out of the sight of your enemies. I'm going to prepare a feast for you right in the presence of your enemies. And I'm going to give you rest while your enemies is in turmoil. And while they won't let sleep come to their eyes until they do something horrible to you, God said, I'm going to give you rest right under their nose. 
How many of you knows you wouldn't have that rest any other way unless you embraced that? And then I took you last week over in the book of Acts. Go there real quickly, and I'm going to go to Ziglag in just a moment. Go to Acts chapter 11. Hurry. Look at this. Verse 27, 11, 27, it says, In these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now about that time... Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword because he saw it please the Jews. He further proceeded to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, delivered him to the four quarterings of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Therefore, Peter was kept in prison. Prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him, etc., etc. Look this way now. The Bible says that there was a prophet that came out of Antioch. Everybody listen closely. A prophet rose up. God anointed him. A man wanted him to prophesy. He stood up. He said, Yay, I say, there's going to be dearth. There's going to be drought. There's going to be famine. And he said, It's going to be terrible. Antioch was a blessed place. Judea was a rough place. Had little resources. Agabus prophesied. He was a true prophet. People put their confidence in his word. When he spoke, they said, it's a word from God. So the Bible says immediately they began to get an offering together and some resources to send to the church in Judea. The Bible said while that was on the way, while that relief was on the way to Judea, to the brethren and the church at Judea, based off the word of the prophet Agabus when he prophesied in Antioch, while that relief was on the way, I want to warn you of something. Hell can see the blessings of God on the way to you. Are you hearing me? I don't know how he does it, but he does it. He, he's not omniscient. The devil is not omnipotent, and he's not omnipresent, but he is smart. He's cunning. He's sly. He's slick. And he's, he's, he's a spirit. And I believe that the devil can see the blessings of God coming our way. I believe he can see him forming. I believe he can see him taking substance. I believe he can see what God is getting ready to do for you, for a church, for a minister, or a ministry. It's like the devil can see that. And God has it on the way to you. He's got it built. He's taking it out of layaway. And now it's coming to you. And while it's on the way, that's when you're going to come under the most major attack. I want you to listen to something, friend. If the devil cannot stop your blessing, which he can't, he will try to spoil it. Are you listening? If he can't stop, what God has promised you and what God is going to do for you, what's been prophesied over you, what God has promised you in your prayer closet, and now it's on the way to you. If he can't stop it, he's going to try to spoil it. You know, the devil has always, as I told you a while back, tried to spoil every holiday for me. I work hard. I live under a lot of pressure. I live under a lot of stress. There's a heavy load on these shoulders, has been for years. I pastored a large church since 1973. I was 22 years old when I started pastoring my first large church. And for, since 1973, I've lived under a lot of stress. And whenever I get time to rest, the devil has always tried to spoil every rest time for me. He's tried to spoil Christmas. He's tried to spoil Thanksgiving. He's tried to spoil any kind of vacation we had. The devil would always try to spit in my soup. 
and get me in some kind of a turmoil of concern and worry over something because he tried to spoil it because he saw that I was going to have some family time or we was going to be blessed somehow. He tried to spoil it. So if the devil can't stop your blessings, he'll try to spoil your blessings. But one day the Lord spoke to my heart. I was going through some things and I was just talking to the Lord and the Lord spoke to me and he said, Blessed are you. When men say all manner of evil against you, he said, son, blessed are you. Whenever the devil is coming in on you to attack you, he said, you're blessed. And you know what? I already knew that. But to hear the Lord say that to my spirit is like it took on a new skin. And then here's what I began to do. I began to say to myself, next time the phone rang and there was hell, Next time somebody was blasting me, next, somebody, next time somebody was trying to undermine my authority, next time somebody's trying to tear the church up, next time they're trying to tear me apart and my family apart, the next time I looked at it different. And instead of going into a mode of concern, here's what I said. Uh-oh, blessings on the way. That's what I said. I said, uh-oh, what's up? What's for supper? You know? And you know what happened? Let me tell you what happened. This is funny. Something happened. It hurt my heart. I immediately rolled it over on the Lord, and I heard the Lord say, you're blessed. And I thought to myself, how? <laughs> the Lord said, you're blessed. And I thought, hmm. You know what? The next day, a man called me. He said, Brother Kilpatrick, he said, would you have lunch with me? I said, sure. I checked my schedule. And I said, yeah, I can do that tomorrow. I had lunch with him. Before he said prayer over the noon meal, he said, I just wanted you to know, and the Lord wanted you to know that you're blessed, John. I said, thank you. And he pulled an envelope out of his pocket, and it was a check for $1,000 to me. And I opened it up, and I said, I'm blessed. <laughs> there, there ain't no two ways about it. I'm blessed. You know what? The next time the phone rang and there was trouble, I said, oh, glory to God. <laughs> Amen. Here's what happened. <laughs> Here's what happened in Acts 11. Agabus prophesied the blessings on the way. Now the Bible says in verse in chapter 12, verse 1, look at this. It says, now about that time Herod stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Here's a blessing on the way to the saints of Judea. You see that? A blessing's on the way. It's just like it's in a big truck, a big rider, a big U-Haul. The blessing's on the way, the offering, the provisions to keep them in a dearth. And they even got Paul and Barnabas coming down there to bring it. So, I mean, Saul and Barnabas is going to bring the blessing, see? And it's like it's on the way to U-Haul, and Saul and Barnabas is driving the U-Haul. It's on the way. The Bible says about that time, that word about that time is another good word for meanwhile, back at the old corral. You know, meanwhile, Herod stretched forth his hand. While the blessing's on the way, Herod goes to try to vex the church. Why did Herod try to vex the church right then? Because blessing's on the way. The devil can't stop it. It's on the way, but he's trying to spoil it. Listen to me, everybody, and listen to me good. Don't allow the devil to spoil your blessings. Next time hell is breaking out all around you, adversity is about to overwhelm you. Don't do what you've always done. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. If you do what you've never done, you'll get what you've never had. Some people, it's, it's predictable when they're going into a depression. Something happens. 
They go down, 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 down. And the devil's just over there like this. I know him so well. I know her so well. All I got to do is what I've always done. I want to warn you today. And the Lord wants to speak to you. The next time something like that happens, don't do what you've always done. Grab your bootstraps, pull them up, plant your feet down real good, and say, you foul spirit in the name of Jesus, I'm going through by the grace of God. <laughs> Who is that coming? I yonder comes Saul now with my U-Haul. Saul's bringing the blessing right to you. Just hold on. The devil's trying to create a bunch of dust out there, so you're going to give up in bleeding. But friend, the blessing was on the way. The devil was only trying to spoil it. Don't you let God... Or, let, God. Don't you let the devil spoil God's blessings on you. Sure. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Glad I caught that. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Go to 1 Samuel. I got a couple of minutes. 1 Samuel 30. I wanted to show you something powerful, and I'm going to quit. This is awesome. I want you to see this, friend. This is so good. Now, Go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And uh, I'll read it in just a moment, but let me explain. Let me give you a little setup before I read it. Now, how many of you knows that Samuel anointed Jesse? <laughs> I need a rest. How many of you knows that? Samuel anointed David to be the future king. How many of you knows when he anointed him, there was already another king? Saul was in power. And how many of you knows that David could not be the next king as long as Saul's in power? God had already resisted him, but he's going to give him a tenure to complete. Sometime we expect God, as soon as he makes some kind of a proclamation, we expect God to just like that, but God sometimes lets things run their course. You have to get used to that. God wants to give time for David to grow up and to get ready to be king. Amen? So while Saul is king, David can't be king, but he's got to grow up. He's got to go through some things. He's got to be tried. He's got to let his patience be entire. He's got to let him work a peaceable fruit in him. He's got to learn wisdom. He's got to be chased by Saul like a rabbit in a desert. He's got to go through some stuff. But a man is still the king. But every day, David is feeling more and more, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. How many of you can feel when you're getting ready for something? I can feel it. You can just feel it. I can't explain it. It's better felt than told. Amen. You can't explain it, but you just know something's about to happen. It says, it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziglag. Verse 3, chapter 30, verse 1. David and his men were come to Ziglag. On the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. They had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their own way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. How many of you know they was upset? They wept until they had no more power to weep. The Bible said, and David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. Say that with me. David was greatly distressed. Look at this. Look at verse 6. The people even spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved and they wanted to take it out on David. Every man for his son and for his daughters. But David 
didn't go into depression. The Bible says David embraced that adversity and he encouraged himself in the Lord. You know, look this way, everybody. One of the main tactics of the devil is whenever great stress comes on you, the devil wants you to shut this Bible and shut your mouth and go off and ponder your trouble and get down in depression. Thank God for David. He opened up the word and he encouraged himself in the Lord. Whoop. And David said to Abathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, he said, I pray, bring me here the ephod. And Abathar brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop and shall I overtake them? And he answered, Yes, go ahead and pursue. You shall overtake them and you will, without fail, recover all. Now go to chapter, uh, same chapter, verse 17. David smote them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day. He fought at least 36 hours. Look at that. David smote them from the twilight until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken away, and David rescued his two wives. There was not one thing lacking to them, nor small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, nor spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David, say this, David recovered all. Say it, David recovered all. Now, that's a powerful story. But reckon what's going on that's unseen. Reckon what's happening that we haven't read about yet. Reckon what's happening in the invisible realm that David doesn't know anything about. Now let me recap this story with you real quickly. The Bible said David went down to Ziglag. They had gone through hell. His wives had been taken. The other men's wives David's mighty men, his, their wives were taken, sons and daughters. They come in, held hostages. They spoiled everything. Hell anointed Ziglag to come against David, the mighty man of God. The Bible said this battle was so severe. It was probably the most severe battle that David faced because, you see, David wasn't just fighting an enemy of Ziglag. But hell anointed David's own people that he loved, that he needed in his life, that he needed to stand with him. Hell anointed them to get their dander up, to get their hackles up. Hell anointed them to even want to take stones and kill their own leader. And they said to David, how could you? Doesn't that make a lot of sense? The devil tried everything on Jesus. And right before Jesus went to the cross, there's his disciples out there asleep. There's Judas betraying him. When he's hanging on the cross, there's nobody there. His disciples had fled. Just John, his brother's there, and his mother's there, and a few little scattering of people that he knew, but they're all gone. How many of you know right before your greatest victory sometime, hell will anoint your own to come against you? Are you listening? The Bible said they even talked about stoning David, their leader. Don't do that. Don't do this. But you see, the thing they couldn't see was this. I'm about to show it to you in the, in the Word. The thing they couldn't see was what was happening out here on the other end that precipitated this happening over here at Ziglag and the devil turning David's people and David's men against David. David was going through probably the most severe trial right before his greatest victory. Let me say that again. David was going through his most severe trial right before his greatest victory. Let me show you what happened. Let's read about it. In 2 Samuel... This is just one chapter over from where I was reading. One chapter over. Look in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 1. 
I'm going to write, I'm going to read verses one through four. The Bible says, now it came to pass after the death of Saul. Look at this. Look at this. When David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag. You see that? Still talking about David and Ziklag. Now let's go look, let's look at this one more time. Look at it carefully with me. It came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, David had stayed two days over in Ziklag. It came to pass on the third day. Everybody look this way. The third day. that behold a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes cl torn and earth upon his head. And it was so, when he came to David, he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, from whence have you come? And he said, oh, I've come out of the camp of Israel and I'm escaped. David said to him, how did things go? I pray, tell me. And he answered, he said, the people are fled from the battle. Many of the people are also fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead. And David said unto the young man that told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan are dead? The young man said, I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa. Behold, Saul leaned upon his own spear, committed suicide. Lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called unto me, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Who art thou? And he said, I am Amalekite. Amalekite killed Saul. Now look this way, everybody. I'm closing. Let's go back. Let's look at it one more time. Ziklag was probably David's greatest battle. Ziklag is when his own people was ready to take up stones and kill their own leader. Ziklag was probably the low point of David's whole life. But isn't it interesting that at the very time they wanted to take up stones and kill their leader, Saul was falling on his own spear on the field and Saul was going to be out of the picture and David was all of a sudden going to become king. David was going to become king virtually at the very moment those people picked up stones and they were about to kill David. At a moment when they wanted to kill him, God was going to elevate him to the throne. Where did that come from? Hell found somebody he could anoint to try to thwart that from happening. And if he couldn't thwart it, he would try to spoil it. Here's what I want to leave with you today. Embrace adversity. Stop resisting it. Embrace it. Because it's through those times that God is going to give you a testimony, and I want to leave this with you. At the very time that you're going through hell, let that time be a proclamation. Blessing is right at the door. Hold on. Be still. Let patience have her work. God will give you the kiss of wisdom. Hold still. When you don't know what to do, be still and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God is about to come through. David could have looked at those men and he could have said, my God, you want to kill me? How dare you? We've been through all this stuff together. You turn against me now. I'm through with you, you bunch of nobodies. David would have got rid of all of his key people right there, see. But the Bible said David went to the Lord and encouraged himself in the Lord, understanding they were only human. But at the very time David was encouraging himself in the Lord, God was bringing Saul down by the sword. Understand this, friend. When you're going through one of your greatest trials, you can't see what's happening on the other end. Be still and see the salvation of the Lord. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. Stand to your feet. You foul spirit in the name of Jesus, I bind you. I bind you, I bind you, I bind you, I bind you. In the name of Jesus, you be bound, you be brought to confusion, you foul spirit. God has not called us to go under. God has called us to raise us up, anoint us, use us 
fill us with the fire of his spirit and to do the work of the ministry. Shoo! I pray over you right now in the name of Jesus. And you pray over me and Steve right now and Chaplin and Richard and Lendl. We're going to pray over you. You pray over us that God will give us all a restful season. Devil, you will not spoil this. I say in the name of Jesus, you will not spoil this. But God is going to give us a restful, peaceful time of joy, relaxation, reinvigoration, recharging of the batteries. Oh God, hell will not stop what you've started and hell will not spoil what you've started. In the powerful and the glorious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, while we're here today, I want Chaplin to go ahead and come. He's going to take 15 minutes. I want everybody to stay here. Don't leave. I want you to hear our heart as Chaplin comes and explains what we're going to be doing and where we're headed. This is very important for you to hear this. It'll take 15 minutes at a maximum. I'm going to sit here myself. We're going to listen to it. God's going to speak to our heart, and we're going to catch a new vision. I'm going to turn it to Chaplain. I want him to come now. Chaplain, I want you to just take your liberty and go for about 15 minutes and just explain this to everybody. Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor wasn't tired a moment ago. He was pressured for time. For time. That's the reason he, he almost made a couple of miscues uh, speaking. And uh, we, we recognize that, um, that uh, the time has gotten away, and we, we understand that. But we feel that uh, this last service before the break, that we should uh, share with you the vision that will take us into the new millennium. And uh, I want you to know that what we're going to share with you has been carefully prayed over and it's going to look simplistic to you. You should have gotten, when you came in with your bulletin, a four-page uh, four uh, handout if you did not get it. If you'll raise your hand right now, the ushers have those, and they'll begin to move through the congregation. Just keep your hand up, and uh, you need one of these copies because uh, it's going to uh, show you where we're going and, and how we're going to get there in the next millennium. Pastor was speaking a moment ago about a church of 25,000, 50,000, and for many of you that was a traumatic statement. And I recognize that because our mentality of church has been just one particular uh, concept, and as a result of that, um, I, I think hell has had a, a hand in, in doing uh, the limiting of our concepts of church. And uh, in so doing, he's limited the outreach and the scope of the ministry that the church can have. But one of the things that God is doing right now in the midst of this revival, he's taking the blinders off of our eyes and he's helping us to see possibilities that we've never been able to see heretofore. And he's asking us to make adjustments in the way we see things and the way we do things in order to accommodate what God is about to do. And I, I want to tell you this. You know, I'm, I rejoice in the vision God's given uh, uh, Steve for Awake America, pastor in uh, the prayer conferences, Lindell in uh, the writing of uh, new materials and all of those things. And, and you know, when you, when you hear about those things and the scope of those things and you begin to look at what I'm going to talk about, this seems like it's maybe a little anticlimactic. But let me tell you, friends, before any great, uh, any great move of God is launched, it has to have a solid base. It has to have a home plate, a home base in which that, uh, that, that will support that thing and hold it steady and, and be a launching pad from which that, uh, uh, th those moves of God are going to be launched. And so uh, it, is it is imperative that we as a church build a strong home base in order to prepare for what God is going to do out there. What God is going to do out there in the nation and in the world is a direct result of what God has, doing, uh, has done and is doing here in this church. And not only what God is, uh, has done, but what God is going to do. I believe that God is going to give this church Pensacola next year. I believe that. 
And I, I don't necessarily believe that all of those people are going to be in this church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about just building browns while I'm talking about God giving this city uh, to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe God wants to do that. And, of course, in order for that to happen, certain criteria have to be met, and we have to be prepared for, what, uh, for the part of the harvest that God is going to give us. Pastor was talking a moment ago about the offering that, uh, that uh, was coming as a result of that famine that Agabus prophesied. If you read 1 Corinthians 16, you'll find that Paul is beginning to collect that money at Corinth, and he's going to bring that uh, to Judea, those Christians in Judea. But in the course of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul talks about three things. He talks about money. He talks about opportunity. He wanted to come to uh, Corinth and spend some time there, but he said there's a great door open for me in Ephesus, and so I can't come right now. And so Paul says there's an opportunity there, but I want to come and get the money when I do come, and I want to spend a winter with you. So he's talking about money. He's talking about opportunity, and then he closes out the letter of 1 Corinthians with a number of people. And so there are three things when God gets ready to do something that, that must be there. There must be money and opportunity and the people for God to use to do what he's going to do. Now, let me tell you, friends, I, I'm, I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about the opportunity. I believe if we have the people and we have the people prepared that God will supply the money and God will give us the opportunity. And so uh, I, I, I want to limit my remarks today to people, okay? People and preparation. And the handout which I've given you is four pages long. And I want to go through this with you very quickly. Brownsville Assembly of God is a church committed to the biblical mandate in Ephesians 4, 11, and 16. Because of that biblical mandate that's printed there, we have developed a mission statement in this church. And I want to put it up here for you right now. And uh, I'd, I'd like the lights dim just a little bit up here if you could, please. Let me see if I can get this thing centered. And I'd like you to write that mission statement down. Because unless you understand this mission statement, you're not going to understand anything that we're trying to do in this church in the coming millennium. The mission statement of Brownsville Assembly of God is reclamation, restoration, and reproduction. Our goal is to reclaim the broken, the battered, the bruised, and bored. And our goal is to restore them to wholeness, and then equip believers to reproduce themselves by reaching other people. Now that's a mouthful. It looks like a simple uh, a, a couple of sentences there, but that is a mouthful to accomplish. Because you see, when people come into the house of God and they hear the message preached and they come to the altar, the salvation is wonderful, but it doesn't stop there because God did not call us just to make converts, but to make disciples that will reproduce themselves and and that's where the real work begins and so our mission statement is that we are going to uh, to uh, reclaim the lost we're going to restore them and we're going to teach them how to re re reproduce themselves now in order to do that we've got to have a paradigm shift in our thinking We've got to come back to a biblical mandate which has been overlooked far too long in the church. You'll see printed in there, uh, in this handout, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. It talks about the five-fold gifts that God has given to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then Paul launches into a description of why God gave those gifts to the church. And here it is in verse 12. First of all, for the perfecting of the saints. Secondly, for the work of the ministry. Third, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Fourth, till we all come in the unity of faith. Fifth, and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, uh, 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 unto a perfect man and into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And six, that we be no longer tossed here and for like children uh, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And number seven, speaking the truth in love, we may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And then it talks about the concept of the body, fitly joined together. 
Now, the pastoral staff at this church is keenly aware of our responsibility to provide this equipping, and we are totally committed to do it for those of you under our care. In other words, there are seven things there that Paul talks about that he has raised up the, the fivefold gifts to do, and we, we take that very seriously as a staff, and we are prepared to equip you to do those things. Our expectation as a result of the mandate that's laid upon us is that each member of this church will find a place of ministry within the body of Christ. Now, the first paradigm shift has to be right here. Because the modern church is of this opinion. They come to church like they go to the supermarket. What's on special today? What can you give me today? The, the mindset must change in the church if we're going to embrace what God is getting ready to do in the coming millennium. We're going to have to get out of the mindset of what can the church do for me, but what can I do for the church? See, the problem for years has been that there have been three or four people rowing the boat and everybody else has been sitting in the boat supervising the three and four and criticizing because the boat is not moving fast enough through this current. But that's got to change, friends. We've got to, everyone must pick up an oar, put it in the water, bend our backs, and begin to row the boat. We understand that, and we're prepared to teach you how to do that. The biblical basis upon which we expect you to go to work and, and, uh, and, and pull the, the load with us is a fourfold biblical basis. The first one is every believer is a minister. Every believer is a minister. You say, I'm not a minister. Oh, yes, you are. If you're a believer, you are a minister. And then I give you about seven bullets there from Scripture that proves to you from Scripture that every believer is a minister. And our second expectation uh, rests upon this. Every ministry is important. Every ministry is not the same, but every ministry uh, that we're going to perform is important. No matter how, how observant it is or how, how, um, um, uh, how, how a voc a vocal or how present it may be to the eyes of people or how it is not present to the eyes of people, every ministry is important. Uh, Lendl mentioned a moment ago the things that go on behind the scenes. You would be absolutely shocked to know how many details must be cared for behind the scenes. And there are people that do that. And they're not on television. Their names are never mentioned, and they're never behind this pulpit. They never speak from a, a microphone. But without them, the ministry would not get done. And so every individual, every ministry is important. The third thing is every ministry is dependent on the other. Everything has to be tied together. Now, let me tell you the, the way most churches are operated. Most churches are operated as little kingdoms. You, you, got, you got the Christian education kingdom, the music kingdom, the youth kingdom, and, and all of these kingdoms that are men's kingdom, women's kingdom, and those, and those kingdoms are in competition with one another. They're in competition with one another. They're trying to get money. They're trying to get volunteers. They're trying to, to, to get people to do things in the ministries. And there are only so many people to go around. There's only so much money to go around. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to kill that concept. We, we want to put that concept to death of competition, of building these little kingdoms and having them compete for the resources in the church. We want to all go the same direction. Listen, if you've got two people paddling in one direction and two people paddling in another direction, the boat isn't going anywhere. But if everybody's paddling in the, wrong, uh, the same direction, then you can move through the current. So every ministry is dependent on the other. And the fourth thing is every believer is gifted. Let me tell you something, friends. You may be the most uneducated. You, might, you may be the most economically deprived person in this congregation, but you have a gift. You have a gift. Now, obviously, if you can't sing, your gift is not the choir. If you can't play an instrument, your gift is not to play one of the instruments. If you can't preach, your gift is not preaching. Okay? But every one of us have a gift. It came with our salvation, and you have to understand that. You say, well, I don't know what my gift is. We're going to help you find uh, what your gift is, and we're going to help you find how your gift fits in to the, uh, the overall workings of the church. Go to page two. Now, I've said to you our expectation is that everyone would become a servant. 
I, and I gave you a biblical basis for that. Now I want to show you the model that we've chosen to equip you uh, to, to do the things that must be done. The model we've chosen is in the form of a baseball diamond. This is not original with us. The Assemblies of God have out a baseball diamond they call We Build People. Uh, Larry Stock still has out a model on a baseball diamond thing over in uh, Baker in his church. But, uh, and so this is not an original idea, but we borrowed uh, the idea, and, and uh, this is how we're going to equip you uh, to, to run the basis so that your Christian walk will become exciting, fulfilling, and preparing you for the work run to God has called you. Go to home plate there. If you want to go from home plate to first base, you have to be a member of the church and be in a group. Okay? This, this is the vision for uh, the, the next millennium. Be in a group and complete the membership class. Okay? The event on first base is we're going to receive you into membership. If you want to go from first base to second base, and listen, we're not going to stand out there with a whip and drive you around the bases. We've told you where we're going. We've told you what, what we, we have to do and, uh, in order to prepare you, and so it's going to be up to you to run the bases. We're going to make the opportunity available for you, okay? So if you want to go from first base to second base, you need to be in a group. You need to complete cleansing stream. You need to com a complete cleansing stream. The event on second base is the cleansing stream retreat. Now, you can go through the seminar. If you don't go through the retreat, you're not on second base, okay? Once you're on second base uh, and you want to go to third, you must be in a group and complete discipleship training. You say, what in the world is that? Well, that is a training that we're going to teach every one of you. You say, I've been saved 40 years. Yes, you might be, but do you know how to disciple somebody? If you, you, you know, you might know how to live the Christian life, but we don't expect you only to live the Christian life. We expect you to be able to reproduce yourself and disciple somebody else. And so we're going to train you to do that, okay? And when you arrive at third base, we will have a giftings retreat. I said to you a moment ago that every believer is gifted. And, and you may not know what your gifting is. We will, we will test you for giftings between second and third base, and then we'll have a retreat, and we'll show you how your gift fits into the overall scheme. Let me give you an example. A server and a mercy person, they don't like each other. They don't understand each other's giftings, and here's the reason why. If you have a church social, the server will get up and start folding up tables and folding up chairs and cleaning up the building while a mercy person is over there with their arm around somebody, petting them and giving them a little bit of love and compassion because they noticed that this person was down during the social event. And the server looks at the mercy person and says, what in the world is he doing over there? I need help with this table. Well, the mercy person could care less about the table. They care about that individual. And so God has these giftings, and it will help you understand why some people in church bug the daylights out of you, and also why you bug some people, okay? And so that giftings retreat is going to be absolutely indispensable. Then if you want to go from third base to home, you must be in a group and complete leadership training. We're raising up leaders here, okay? In order to, to have a church of 12,000, 25,000, 50,000, we're going to have to have leaders. And when, when you've completed all the bases, then we're going to release you into one of the four ministries that God has given us here. Now, Lila mentioned a moment ago about intercessory prayer over the city. This thing is going, friend. I'm telling you, this thing is blossoming and growing. And this Tuesday night... You need to be here in this room because it's going to be packed with people, not just Brownsville people, but from people from all over this city and different churches. We're going to have a film. We're going to have people from Sentinel here to teach us and lead us in intercessory warfare prayer over this city so that God can destroy the strong men and we can spoil the house. Okay, we're going to take the city, and so uh, some of you are going to be raised up to go into intercessory prayer. You say, why can't I just go into intercessory prayer? We want you trained because we don't want you to, you to, uh, to, to get out there and be ill-equipped to do what you need to be doing. Listen, I, I bet it was in the military for years, you know that. Did you know we never sent anybody into combat without sending them through basic training, advanced training, and then a specialty training? We never did that. No matter how great the war was, we sent people through training. You know why? Because when you get out there and the bullets are flying, you've got to have somebody that knows what they're doing and somebody with a little confidence in them, and that's what training does. It shows you what to do. It builds confidence so that you don't run when the bullets start flying. Okay? 
Now, so some of you are going to go into intercessory prayer. Some of you are going to go into a community outreach. Let me tell you what God's doing right now with community outreach. Uh, Bob Martz, where are you? Bob, get up and come up here. Uh, God is giving us an, a community outreach that is going to impact this city like you would not believe. We are right now in the process of partnering with the county and some other agencies. And uh, God has raised up Bob Martz, and he, he's been brought on staff to head this community outreach up. And I thank God for him. This guy is one of the most gifted guys uh, that, uh, that you could possibly find. And he's a product of revival, by the way. God has sent them in. God knew that this was coming. You see, we've been trying to do community outreach on a limited basis for several years. Kathy Mack, who's here uh, today, she uh, helped us in the beginning. But we had a larger vision than that. And, and God is giving us a facility. And by January, this thing is going to be up, it's going to be running, and we're going to touch Pensacola for the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You say, where's the money coming from? We, the money's going to come, friend. The opportunity's there. We just need the people to manage this thing, and so Bob is going to be calling on you. We're going to need a ton of volunteers. We're going to need men that are skilled uh, in painting and, and, and cutting grass and doing all kinds of things. We're going to go into these communities, and we're going to transform these communities. God's going to help us do it. We need telephone operators. We need volunteers. We need street witnesses. Uh, we need all kinds of people. And so we're going to train you to do this. This thing is going to impact Pensacola like you cannot possibly believe. And God's given us the man to head that up. His name is Bob March. So if in, in a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to fill out an interest survey sheet. And Bob's going to be looking at that, I can promise you, very, very closely. So don't put anything on that interest survey sheet unless you're willing to back it up with actions. A little check mark on a sheet's not going to get it, friend. We're going to be knocking on your door. Okay? Thank you, Bob. Praise God. And welcome aboard, buddy. Hallelujah. The third thing is cleansing stream. God is blessing this church through cleansing stream. We are now a regional retreat center. In 3rd and 4th of December, we'll be doing a retreat here with over a 1,000 people in attendance for that retreat. People are coming in from all over the country. Questions are coming in. We're being, uh, we're being asked to come to New Zealand in January and do a cleansing stream retreat for five or 600 leaders in the, station, uh, in the nation of New Zealand. We did that last year or this year, and we're going to do it again in January. It's just taking hold like wildfire in New Zealand. Malta, the island of Malta. Uh, I was in the Navy on the last ship that made a port call in Malta when it went from democracy to socialism. And now Christianity is impacting Malta. The pastor that's invited us has been here to the revival, been transformed, caught the vision of cleansing stream, took it back, taught it to his leaders, and he's paying the way for six of us or five of us to go over and do a retreat for his leadership, and cleansing stream will be, be implanted in the nation of Malta, a socialist nation. And not only that, but just this past week, we got another call to come to Barbados. I know all of you would like to go, but we, you, you know, you haven't gone through the training, so you can't go, you see? But we're going to Barbados, do a cleansing stream retreat. Just go down there and suffer for Jesus, you know? <laughs> Eat your heart out, you lazy people that wouldn't go through cleansing stream and cleansing discipleship. Just eat your heart out. We're going down there and do cleansing stream, lay on the beach a couple of days. Hallelujah. And so cleansing stream, all these people that community outreach is going to bring in, these people are going to have to be cleaned up. As, the, as, as God gives us Pensacola, we're going to have to get these people delivered and set free. And cleansing stream is the thing that's going to do that. And God's raised up a tremendous core. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, some of you that's already been through cleansing stream and discipleship, you're about to go through discipleship again. And this time we're putting you in a two-year program so that when you come out the other end, you're going to be as big as a giant spiritually so that you can take on any spirit that we're faced with in the coming days, weeks, and months if Jesus tarries. Just, I'll just drop that for you to encourage you a little bit. A lot of work. And then the fourth thing is grace groups. Let me tell you something, friends. Let, let me ask you this. If we had 3,000 converts this morning, could we assimilate them with our present situation? Can we? There's no way we can assimilate 3,000 people. Yet that happened in the book of Acts, and they assimilated them. 
A few days later, 5,000 more. 8,000 people in just a few days. You know what that uh, influx of people into the kingdom of God did to the temple worship and to the synagogue? It destroyed those two things and, and the church replaced synagogue and temple. And I'm going to tell you, friend, I'm going to tell you what's happening right now. With an influx and a growth of people like God's about to send to us, it's going to destroy the concept of church as usual. If you got a, con a synagogue concept or a temple concept, forget it. We cannot assimilate the, the, the influx of people that are going to be coming in the kingdom of God with our present structure. And so we've got to change. You can't put into a new wine in old wineskins. New wine expands, and it will burst an old wine skin. And so what we've got to do is get a new wine skin. Are we going to change the gospel? No way. We're going to change the method. The message remains the same. The method changes. And so grace groups is where it's going to go. And uh, listen, you might say, and uh, Lendl mentioned a moment ago, that uh, the program-based pro church, uh, program church would probably still be here. Uh, through all of this. No, it won't. It's already gone. You don't know it, but it's already gone. See, something happened and it didn't even hurt. Do you know how you kill a sacred cow in church? You slit its throat. You never shoot it. It makes too much racket. You slit its throat and let it die a quiet death. And I want to tell you what's already happened. We've already absorbed men's ministry, women's ministry, Sunday school, Royal Rangers, missionettes. Everything is already, in, uh, already absorbed into the cell ministry. You say, well, I thought that uh, uh, you were talking about cell ministry and, and Sunday school. No, we're talking about the same thing. We're just talking about a different way of doing the same thing so that it can accommodate the necessary growth. And let, let me tell you something, friends. I don't know what this does for you. Pastor's excited about the prayer conferences out there, and that's good. He's excited about the church, and that's good. But I am super excited about the church. I'm super excited about what God's going to do here. Yes. Now, in order to, uh, to accommodate these things, it's understood that it's going to take some changes in thinking. And, and uh, number one, uh, you've never been in a church before that's going to be as involved in community outreach as this church is going to become. I, I don't know of another church that's going to be as deeply involved. I've never, we don't have a model of another church that's going to be as deeply involved in community outreach as this church is. I, I can't begin to, uh, in this limited time, share with you everything that's going to happen, but I'm telling you, it is going to impact this community. It's going to impact this community. And so in order for us to to do that, we've got to have an army of volunteers, an army of volunteers. We've got to shift our focus from the pulpit to partnership. Now listen, is pastor going to go away? No, he isn't. We're still going to enjoy those great messages like the one this morning. We'll enjoy those every Sunday morning. But the, pro the, the thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to change our thinking because, you see, in most modern churches, the focus is on the pulpit. The focus is on the pulpit. And we have a concept that the people that do the ministry are the people we have hired to do the ministry. This concept is a change, you see. Those of us who, have, who are on staff, we're on paid staff, we are here for the purpose of training you to do the ministry according to Ephesians 4. Okay? And that's what we're going to do. And so we need for you to start thinking in these concepts and, and understand that pastor can't do all of this and you can't go sit down with him and spend a lot of time with him because he has a mandate from God to do certain things. But God has put in place other people here and other individuals here that can perform the work that pastor could do when the church, or to, that pastor could do for you when the church was 200 or 250. He can't do that now. He's one man. And, and one man cannot pastor that many people with hands on. And so the rest of us are here as his fingers, his hands, his arms to carry out these ministries. And folks, you're just going to have to adopt a mindset that I'm going to receive ministry from these guys. I'm going to receive ministry from pastor through these guys and gals and people that God's going to put in place here. Now, I'm closing. 
conclusion. It's understood that this is a radical departure from the traditional church model. What we must come to grips with is the fact that God is positioning us to give us the city and raising us up to be the leadership in bringing the nation to prayer. In order to be prepared to fulfill our destiny, we must adjust to new and innovative methods of doing things. Hence, the need to equip an army of ministers for the work just ahead of us. Now, on the back, you'll see the fourth page. There's an interest survey there. And before you leave this congregation this morning or this auditorium, I'd like for you to fill that out. I'm going to tell you why. Because you'll tuck it in your purse or Bible, and three months later, you'll, you'll discover that you've never done that. And so what I'd like for you to do, I'd like for you to take a moment and fill that out right now. I'm going to turn this back to Pastor. And before you leave this morning, ushers, I'd like you at the doors to collect these. And let me ask you to do this, friends. When you check something on that sheet, be sure you're ready to do it because we're coming to see you about that, okay? And, and if you say, well, I, I don't have time, I just can't do that, you know, I just checked that, then I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to say, were you serious or were you not serious? I'm going to challenge you about that because we've got to raise up this army, and this army has to be equipped, and this army has to be available to us in order to do the work whereunto God's called us. God bless you, and thank you so much. Uh, while I have everybody here before you disperse, there's no way I can get the word to you. Tuesday night, uh, I found out that we will be having uh, the meeting, the citywide prayer meeting here. And I would love for the worship team to be here if you could. And Mike will be leading worship and the musicians. Also, choir, if you could be here at 930 in the morning for the next few Sunday mornings until the 31st and meet over in the the Family Life Center, we're going to sing. Those of you that are in town, we're going to sing and lift up the Lord. That's all I need to say. Go ahead, if you will, please be filling this out. Take a moment and look it over. We need you to do this. It's very serious that we do this. Friend, it'll take a little while for you to absorb everything that you have before you. Pathway to ministry, it'll take a while for you to absorb where we're headed and what we're doing. I want you to know I feel tremendous about this. This is the way the church is going. How many of you have gotten this month's Charisma Magazine, December's Charisma Magazine? If you've got it, or if you hadn't got it, please get a copy and read every article in there. This is one of the best charismas they've ever put out. It cast a vision for the year 2000 about what the church is going to be like and what the church is going to look like. And what it looks like is this right here. And we didn't even know it when we came up, but it, it looks just like this right here. God, friend, listen, God is about to do some powerful things in this world, and I want you to be a part of it. But not only this world, that's my concern, but this city is our concern. And God is going to use you to help take this city. All right, if you will, please go ahead and mark that, and on your way out, turn those into an usher. Ushers will be standing at the doors. If you will, please stand with me. I want to bless you. Glory to God. I am excited, 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 excited. Woo! Hold your hand up this way, your right hand. Father, I bless this congregation. This is not a usual congregation, Lord. This is unusual. Has to be for you to pour out your spirit in this place like you have. Lord, I bless this people, this trustworthy congregation, people of integrity, godly character, godly wisdom that you have called, set apart, and now raising up to take Pensacola for Jesus. And Lord, I bless this congregation. We proclaim that evangelists, pastors, prophets, apostles, and teachers are going to come from this nest that you have raised up. But Lord, not only that, but other ministers, torchbearers, those that's been called to cast out devils, Heal the sick. Oh God, those that you have gifted with the gift of faith, those that you have raised up with a word for this hour and a word for this city, Lord, let that begin to work even today in this congregation. 
Lord, go ahead and begin to engender that in their spiritual genes. So when the opportunity presents itself, it'll come rolling out of their mouth and come flowing out of their hands. Use this crowd, Lord. I bless them. Bless them with health, Lord. Bless them with vision. I pray, Lord, especially that you will bless Brownsville with vision. Let this church not be like other churches where they come to get, but Lord, let this church be raised up to say, where are they? When can I get to work? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.